And I'm back. All right. Oops. Might blow that. Okay. Consulting my notes here. Got it. So what we're gonna do? Open that, and we're gonna do a new document. Title it outline. I'm going to show you my process or the, the way I've chosen to do it for this specific uh, story. There's no right way. There's no wrong way. There's just ways. And um, in terms of stories, uh, there, are, there are kind of two main camps of outlining. There's the group that outlines everything first and then starts writing and then the people that write and outline and outline later those are the two main camps and i tend to be the former but i don't go at it as hardcore as everyone does uh, mostly because i find at least personally that if I don't have a plan in place, then I run into problems very easily and my focus gets divided and I stop writing. I run into writer's block, which is just poor planning <laughs> and lack of discipline. But yeah, um, so I'm of the first camp. Though what I tend to do is I tend to do a basic outline and then I'll write some things and then I'll revisit the outline and make more detail. And then I'll write some more things, detail, more things, detail. Um, I find it helps me better in that sense. The other school is the writing then outlining camp. It's the camp that my friend Sam does where he'll write a bunch of scenes and then he'll piece together a story from those scenes. So he'll take the things that he's written and he'll say, well, this is an intro or this is a, a climax or this is a, an obstacle and he'll lay them into the story and do it like that. And then he'll write an outline from those, those little bits. I don't do it that way. I don't like doing it that way. Uh, it's, I don't work productively that way, which I think is the most important way to look at it. Um, it's not very conducive to, to how I think and how I write. But if you want to do it that way, that's certainly okay. So yeah, it's up to you. But I'm going to show you my process, or at least the process I've chosen, because it tends to be a little bit, at least for me, it tends to be very story specific. I'll do it one way on one story and a slightly different way in another story. And I think a lot of authors will like that. Um, but yeah. Oh, so hot. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay, so we have our logline, we have our synopsis from these details and, and the things that we've talked about in terms of, you know, a three act structure. What do we have for this story? I'm going to do something fancy. I'm going to do it like this.
Yeah, you want to start up an accidental origin it's hot drinking game? I'm cool with that. Oh, actually, is this a picture? This is a picture. I'm gonna do some fancy Scrivener things. Check this out. Research. Three act structure. Um, and I want to, oh, what do you do? Oh, no, that, that failed. <laughs> Let's try that again. Three act structure. Do do do. Come on, you can get there. Them loading screens. Them loading screens. Ah. Oh my. Sometimes. Sometimes. <sighs> Probably is. Probably is melting. There we go. I got it. Got it. Got there, no problem. Just gonna copy this so I have it. Put this back. Cool. Yeah, awesome. So the synopsis. So, I'll read out the synopsis, mostly because I haven't done this in a few weeks, and uh, A, I want to be sure of the details, and I also want you all to, to know what's going on. So, after, the crossroads, after his crossroads deal falls through, a destroyed billionaire seeks, should be an S there, to regain his power by, man, my typing is bad, summoning the demon he made a deal with. In order to do that, he needs the blood of a fawn and the feather of a siren for the ritual under a winter waterfall during the rising moon. An ancient siren has to escape a killer for hire and goblin raiders looking for her feathers so that she can stop the ritual and prevent the demon from being summoned. So, who's our main character? And who's our perspective character? Because they don't have to be the same person. By the way. Uh, my favorite example is being Sherlock Holmes. If you've ever read a Sherlock Holmes story, Watson is the perspective character. Holmes is the main character. But yeah.
But I thought the billionaire was the villain. Is the billionaire not the villain? What sorcery is this? This is my clever expression, by the way. I mean, clever. You bring up a good point. Or, in canon, we have brought up a good point. How many characters? Like, who are our main characters? We have the billionaire. We have the demon. We have the siren. Killer for hire. The goblins. And even though he's not mentioned in here, we have the fawn. So, who's going to be our protagonist? Who's going to be an antagonist? The villain. The person who is anti Antagonist. Hey Sam, glad you make it. VRing, I hope was fun. Um. So yeah, who's our protagonist? Who's our antagonist? Who are our supporting characters? Who are our minor characters? Because they're different. Um. What do you think, chat? What do you think? I know what I think. And I get final say because this is my stream. <laughs> but, but, I'm always willing to be influenced if you have a good, a good thought. <laughs> I can believe it, man. I can believe it. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. So, I think. Oh, yeah, I should probably explain that a little bit more. So, uh, the protagonist is the main character, the hero of the story. Uh, the antagonist is the person who opposes them. It tends to be the villain of the story, though it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, other types of characters, uh, supporting characters, uh, characters who... Uh, a supporting character is a character who plays a large presence in the story, but isn't necessarily uh, the main character, tends to be the romantic interest, though a lot of people just set the romantic interest as a separate character, uh, separate type uh, entirely. Um, other supporting characters, um, for example, uh, if we use Lord of the Rings, uh, the main character is Frodo, Supporting character, uh, the main antagonist is Sauron. And the supporting characters are the Fellowship. Uh, though, though, in the third movie, uh, a little bit more in some of the others, but in the third movie, Aragorn is also a protagonist. And you can have more than one. Um, just like you would have more than one antagonist. There's no real set limit, though having more than probably five seems dumb to me. <laughs> or really difficult to pull off well. I could, I, I have seen arguments 
about Lord of the Rings where people have argued that Sam is the main character. And I can see the logic behind that. But the only problem is, is that his dramatic want slash need is to create a giant garden that spans the entirety of Middle Earth. And it's super dumb. And they spend five or ten pages on it. On, on that specific dream. And it's it's awful to read. <laughs> it's so awful. <sighs> but yeah. Also. Uh, part of that is. Uh, one of the other reasons why I don't necessarily buy into Sam being the main character. Is because. Uh, if he was given the ring, he would immediately use it, use his power, and he, for me, he doesn't have the right type of strength and willpower to fight for something bigger than himself, bigger than just his wants. So yeah, I don't know. But yeah, so let's 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 do some of this outline <laughs> that I've been staring at. So, in my opinion, the siren is the protagonist. Uh, let's do this a little bit nicer, so it's easier to read. I am aware that he carries Frodo for like li like literally carries him for most of it. I'm just saying that there's an argument there for sure, but I don't buy it. perspective character that we should tell this story from is the killer for hire and I'll explain that a little bit after I finish getting these out I think the antagonist is the demon I think the supporting characters are the billionaire and the fawn because I don't see the billionaire as an actual antagonist I just see him as uh, a supporting character And I think the goblins are minor characters. They're in there, but they're minor. So. That's hard to read. Let's go back to this view. That's better. Oh, this is super low as well. There we go. Now you can read it. So. The reason I chose the Killer for Hire as a perspective character and not the Siren is because I want the Killer for Hire to be an anti-hero. I want him to be uh, a bad person who does good things sometimes. And I am super intrigued by the idea of and maybe, maybe, maybe I'm immediately not following my own advice, but I'm intrigued by the idea of setting the story up as the killer for hire's goal of taking out the siren. 
misdirecting the reader from the overall goal of defeating the demon. But that's just the way that I'm thinking about it. Um, so yeah. Whew. It's so hot. So hot. All right. So, with that in mind, with that in mind, what elements of our synopsis are we going to plug into our structure in order to start building this story? So I'm gonna write a couple of elements down and, and we can talk about them. Uh, we can talk about them as they apply to the story. Um, so uh, we're gonna have our introduction. Let's do it like this, yes. Our introduction, our inciting incident, Our rising action, our climax, falling action, and the resolution. All right. So we're gonna we're gonna get at least these elements tonight. Um, there's more parts of outlining uh, that I'm going to talk about a little bit more next week uh, with it, with in terms of the difference between scene outlines and structure outlines. This is a structure outline. We are creating the dramatic arc of our story. There's also what we call scene outlines which are the outlines, uh, like the, the breakdown of scenes, individual pieces that make up the story and how they fit in with the structure and also how they uh, pull the reader along with internal versus external scenes and different ways of, of approaching the story. Um, I usually work from scene outlines, to be honest. Uh, I like them a lot. I wanted to break this one down a little bit more before I got into scenes. Mostly because I don't have any, because it was randomly generated, I don't have any specific scenes in mind with the exception of one or two. Uh, and those one or two are probably going to be the sort of like climax, maybe inciting incident, maybe just another main obstacle sort of style ones. Um, but I'll go over those uh, as part of doing this exercise. Um, so yeah. So I'll pull up the synopsis here on the side. And fix that little corner there. So, the interesting thing, because I want to use a different perspective character from the protagonist, and I've stated that his goals are inherently different from the get-go, we're actually going to do this weird thing in my head, or at least the way I look at it in my head, where we're going to take two dramatic arcs, so basically two sets of structure, and we're going to join them in half. We're going to take the, the end half of the Siren one and the beginning half of the Killer for Hire one. We're going to create a new story. Well, not a new story, but we're going to create a new structure with both of those elements. And how they mesh together is, I think, what's going to make this story interesting. At least it is to me at the moment. So, yeah. So... Hot. It's hot. 
so hot. Sighting incident. The billionaire. Supporting character. Pays. The killer for hire. To. Get. Um. Ugh. Pays the kill for hire to get a vile, uh, a, uh, a, a skin, there we go, a wine skin of blood and a handful of feathers from the siren. The climax, um, and it's okay to jump around like this uh, when you're doing your own outlines. Fill in the stuff you know concretely, and then figure out what you need to do to get from those points uh, to get from one to the other. So I put an inciting incident there. I'm gonna put the climax in. Then we're gonna fill in. You know, what's the rising action gonna look like? What's gonna be the main obstacles and problems that happen in, in a very general detail we're not going to necessarily be like oh uh there are 10 things that need to happen here we're just going to give it an overall like you know what kind of thing are we going to see here so i think that the climax at least in the moment is going to be the ritual under the moonlight Okay, cool. So, what's gonna happen in a rising action? What do you think? How do we get from the killer for hire getting a contract to a confrontation and I'll write that down. At the ritual under the moonlight. How is the story gonna be resolved? Is it going to be a good ending? Are they gonna succeed? The siren and the killer for hire? Are they gonna fail? What if they fail, but the consequences aren't bad for them? Like, we haven't set what the consequences of this demon actually being summoned are. We assume they're bad because he's a demon, and we assume all demons are bad, just in general. I don't really think that all the time. I think they're more just selfish creatures. But, you know, I mean, that's a matter of perspective and a, and a matter of style. Like, what are you trying to say? What are you trying to approach? What, how are you interpreting that fantasy creature? Um, but yeah. What if the consequences for them failing are not nearly as bad as they thought? What if they get to the confrontation and the consequences are actually good. So they decide to fail anyway. I mean, I'm just, at, I, I'm just asking blind questions. I don't have a particular one that I think is, is better than the others, but there, there's, a lot of int uh, there's a lot of open interpretation. There's a lot of Like, we're not going to have answers to those questions necessarily right at this moment. Uh, I'm going to put something down that I think is going to be the way I'm going to I'm gonna shape the story towards. Um, 
but there's no right answer. And when we get more into character and defining who characters are and why they're doing what they're doing and what their needs and wants and all that are, we're going to, we're going to take another look at this and revise it and, and figure out, you know, what does the demon want? What's his purpose? Is he just causing mass carnage? Like, you know, they're, whatever he's doing. And figuring out how, what, what resolutions come from that. What character arcs come from that. Um, yeah. So, you know, like I said, you know, it, it, the writing process is really a process of laying something down and then coming back to it with more detail later. And, and exactly, Johnny, the demon could be totally harmless. Totally harmless. Um, that, that's, that's certainly something that can happen. Um, not necessarily. And in this case, I don't think so. But uh, I'm open to interpretation. If this were an epic, it would be a journey that would happen here. This was, uh, and I mean, as, because we've talked about it a few times, and I think it's one that people kind of know. Um, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is an epic. There is a long journey. Long, long journey. This is a short story and or novella. It's going to be five to 15,000 words. I can't write an epic. I don't, have, I don't have the space. I don't think this idea really fits an epic, at least the way that I'm approaching it. I don't think it needs to be an epic. I don't want it to be an epic. So it's not going to be a journey, or at least not an on-screen one uh, in that way. I think what we're going to see here is we're going to see several conflicts. We're going to see the killer for hire in conflict with the siren. He wants to kill her. Or at the very least, to get the materials he needs. Which, to do so, he probably has to kill her. Because she doesn't want to give him up. So, there's going to be that. There's also going to be elements of the killer for hire in conflict with his contract. Right? We want... The Siren is the main character. The Siren is... Has... A dramatic need to stop the demon. For whatever reason. The Siren has to convince... The Killer for Hire... Or stop the Killer for Hire from stopping her from doing that. And I've stated this several times over the course of this story, but the killer for hire to me is not an antagonist. He's not the bad guy. He's an anti-hero. So in order for him to be a true anti-hero, we need to con the siren needs to convince him to join her side, to do the right thing in this specific instance. And that means that there's an internal conflict within the killer for hire. And 
another the last element of the rising action that I think is going to be part of the story is that there's going to be the demon slash billionaire slash goblins also have a physical conflict with the siren. There are players. They are moving throughout the stage. They're bouncing off each other, creating conflicts, creating drama, making the story interesting. Just catching up on chat here. So, following action. I once saw Peter David at a convention in Toronto. Peter David is a comic book writer. Uh, for the most part, he's written some novels and, and a few other things, but he's mostly a comic book writer. Um, he had a stroke a few years back. But he started writing again, and that's super awesome. Um, because the, the talk that I saw of him has kind of stayed with me uh, for many years now. Um, and the one thing he said to me, or well, he said to the group, I guess. It wasn't just me. I wasn't the only person there. But the one thing he said was that Karate Kid, the first one, the original, starring... Um, uh, God... That guy who was in everything at the time. Anyway, the original Karate Kid from the 80s. Uh, is one of the best examples of how a three-act structure should work. Because it's ridiculously clear. The inciting incident. So, you have, you have a loser character who meets an old man who and starts helping him out and there are bullies and the bullies say we practice karate fight us and he says okay and he trains rising action he trains inciting incident fight us rising action he trains climax final fight he gets on he gets on one leg and does the crane kick Fight ends, falling action. Resolution, he won, he defeated the bullies, he gained respect for his teacher. Movie ends, the end. That climax to ending is three minutes long in movie time. It's three minutes. That's a good fucking ending. So yeah. And endings are one of the hardest part of writing, uh, simply because it's so easy to screw them up. It's so easy to miss uh, your character's inherent wants and needs. It's so easy to um, to force your own sort of writer presence on it to to teach something. Um, yeah, it's difficult. So the thing that I'm thinking of, I think there's going to be, uh, an aftermath of the ritual and the resolution going back to the killer for hire 
is that there's a change in the status quo. At least for the moment. Uh, and obviously this is super general. Uh, I haven't really listed a ton of specifics here. But I think this is a good, the, for me and the way that I'm approaching the story at the moment, I think this is indicative of the arc that I'm trying to go for. And the more that we work on this project, the more that it's going to become apparent uh, how this all fits together. Introduction. Uh, something about the world, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I don't have a specific scene in mind. Uh, a good way to introduce it would be meeting at the King's Stables. And that'll kind of give us details about the Killer for Hire and um, the Billionaire. And the general forces at play. So, the only other uh, the only other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about before I take my second break is that. right here this right here is the dramatic arc of the story not all of this has to show up in the actual text and I know that people are gonna give me this look like what do you mean how can you not show all the parts isn't that the point and the answer is well, yes, but when you're dealing with things like short stories and other short forms, like short mediums, what you'll find is, is that you don't have enough time or space to really detail all of these things. You can't show every single little thing in between. They're not interesting. Um, they're not interesting. You're wasting space. Uh, various other consideration and and so because of that we're gonna start we're gonna start probably somewhere in here like the first scene of the story is probably gonna be something like this so I'm going to do with this. The, the killer for hire and the siren meeting. But the other cool thing about storytelling is that most storytelling is non-linear. It doesn't happen event, 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 event. It's not interesting to tell a story that way. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on the story. You can tell the story that way. But we have this awesome tool called nonlinear storytelling with flashbacks, flash forwards, telling things out of order, going back and revealing new details about things we previously saw. Also called a retcon or retroactive continuity. These are techniques that we can use in order to be more effective with how our story unfolds. You don't have to tell it front, front to back, beginning to end. You can start at the end and go back to the beginning. You can start at the end, go back to a little bit before the end, and then go back a little bit before that, and then a little bit before that, and end with the beginning. You know who did that?
or a great example of doing that? Pulp Fiction. The first scene is the ending. And every other scene leads up to that ending. And it all ties together nicely. So yeah. Um, because, you know, this inciting incident intrigues me. I would like to write this scene. I don't think I'm going to start with this scene, though. I don't think this scene is interesting to start with. It doesn't introduce our protagonist. It introduces our perspective character, for sure, and his goals and wants and needs and whatever. But it doesn't introduce our protagonist. So, yeah. There's that. Um, and the other thing uh, I will say a little bit about is... Uh, remember when I started doing this, the started working on this, uh, I don't know, it was like a half hour ago, I guess. Um, but remember I was saying that I'm almost going to be doing like the Killer for Hire's dramatic arc and then the Siren's dramatic arc. So when we look at this, we see that in the introduction and inciting incident and rising action, we have the Killer for Hire's arc, like very strongly. We have... His inciting incident. We have his introduction to his world. We have his conflicts. But his conflicts become the conflicts of the siren. And therefore, we end with the siren's dramatic, which, dramatic arc of a confrontation at the ritual, the aftermath of the ritual, and the changes in the status quo. So there you go. I did what I said I was going to do. <laughs> but yeah. Um, so. Uh, anything else I wanted to mention in this? Uh... to the kingdom? Something to think about. Thinking about it a little bit. And delete this. I'll make this a separate file, I think. So it's 8.59, I'm gonna take another five minute break. And uh, then we're gonna come back. Uh, and I realized that I totally forgot uh, one of the things I said I was gonna do. So we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about names. Yay! Tentative names, working titles. And then uh, we're gonna do the book club any Q and A's and wrap things up. So I will see you all at 9.05. Cool? Cool. All right.